morning, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to present on behalf of the Geoinformation Processing Department um, a little bit what we do. My name is Frank Ostermann. Um, I'm portfolio research in that department. And to confuse you a little bit, I've chosen uh, the name of our research theme, which is Spatial Temporal Analysis, Maps and Processing as a title. Um, but I think it explains a little bit better already what we do. And we have quite a history also in working with the uh, eScience Center, both in projects, but we also, and you will hear more about that more later today, but also in terms of uh, education and help. So the, the courses that you offer are just a great resource. We encourage PhD students to, to use them. Um, I myself have benefited from them just recently because in that sense, maybe I'm, I'm a bit of a typical researcher. I wrote my first useful program 35 years ago but I never learned it properly. I never learned how to, to program properly, and so I, to this day, I remain a lousy programmer, I'm afraid. So first, I'll tell you a little bit about what we do. Um, I'll try to keep that short in the interest of time, and then I'll also tell you a little bit uh, about the software that we use, uh, because like Frank, I, I also did a small survey among our colleagues what, what software they actually use. So, um, the starting point for us is that everyone needs spatial and temporal information about their environment. And the more detailed, usually the better, the, the more frequent, the more recent, the better. But still, of course, you need to process all of that. You need to ingest it, you need to, to analyze it, and you need to present it in a way that makes sense to the users. So managing these flows of geodata, of geoinformation, that's our main concern. That's the puzzle that uh, we're trying to solve, or contribute to solving it. Um, we focus on societal problems with changes in space and time, and you can already see. So we also have done and continue to work, do some work on public health. Um, food supply is an important uh, element of our work. And we focus mostly on methods and techniques to create such actionable geo-information. Uh, we use both remote sensing imagery, but also new sensors in small, affordable, in situ sensors, Internet of Things. We use a wide variety of methods from agent-based model modeling to deep learning, but of course, important remains that last step, the visualization of that information. Right, so that's the last point. Um, provide modern and fit for purpose products and services to many different user contexts. Some keywords um, which don't match the, uh, the research information system quite, that's, that's, uh, that the UT has, these are more accurate. And you'll see that we have, we, we try to cover the entire range of processing that's necessary and we, we focus on the cha changes in space and time from the application side, from the GIS and remote sensing side, but also linking up with computing sciences and digital humanities. Some examples. On the left, you see uh, work on modeling epidemics. So that was actually done also with agent-based modeling. Of course, during the pandemic, we also tried to contribute something useful. So we created uh, colleagues from the, the cartography and information visualization uh, group created uh, stunning graphics that um, combined a lot of information in an accessible way. We continue to work on uh, things also related to, to climate change, but also health, like um, upcoming Lyme disease in the Netherlands through more ticks. An important part of our word, our work, work, I already mentioned that, is food, sec food security. Um, so a larger project that we had a couple of years ago was STARS, um, which also used remote sensing imagery, right? On the right-hand side, you see uh, a software that was uh, written by a PhD candidate um, on collaborative pest management. Presentation is later today, so I'll just go on. Um, what you see on the left-hand side was also done with support from the eScience Center, analysis of uh, phenological changes on a continental scale. So here, the processing part 
how to manage that massive data set, time series data set was the key. But we also care about organizing information, organizing knowledge. So we also have colleagues who work on the semantics of storing and finding information. And we want to engage with citizens. So we have several projects that engage with citizens that try to, to link up with them and not only use them as a source for information, but also as collaborators. Another important keyword cross-cutting for us is we try to be open. So we uh, try to further open science and practice um, by using open software, by making our work reproducible and replicable, and um, to discuss the roles of functions of science and society in general. We also believe that uh, we should be doing team science. So it's not small groups of one or two researchers, but ideally more working together across disciplines, across departments. Now for that second part, I said I'd present to you some software that we've been using. Um, in the little survey, it came out that a huge portion of our group uses Jupyter for some work, um, mostly Python, but it really forms a backbone of, I would say, roughly half of the work that is being done at the moment. To be a little bit more precise, many of those colleagues who use Jupyter do that with the scikit-learn library, which of course is, is one of the big ones if you ever want to do machine learning with Python. So that's being used a lot. But we also use a lot of true and tried solutions, especially when it comes to storing uh, spatial data. So uh, PostgreSQL, PostGIS, and various extensions that have been developed for that form an important part of our research software arsenal. Then we have a couple of more specialized libraries that are being used. Um, we also use R, although to a somewhat lesser extent. And I just learned yesterday it's not R Studio anymore, it's something else. Um, so they changed name. Um, of course, we are, we are doing GIS. So maybe some of you have been wondering where's actually, when's the first GIS uh, going to pop up? Here we have it, QGIS um, is used for a variety of, of purposes, mostly to create um, nice maps, of course. But then more specialized libraries, like for example, GeoPandas. Um, but we also use other machine learning libraries. So for example, uh, TensorFlow libraries are being used in our department by, by several colleagues, me included. Um, again, so this is not uh, grouped thematically, right? So it may be a bit jumping back and forth, but our cartographic colleagues, they use a lot of the libraries like Leafland and Open Layers to create nice products to communicate with the wider world. But as I said, we do agent-based modeling as well, right? So, and for that, we mostly use uh, NetLogo. And our semantics uh, colleagues use software like Protege and, and GraphDB to do their work. But then there's much more, right? So I got a really wide range. A uh, few colleagues use this, others use that. So we have Haskell as a language. We have uh, we use uh, Amazon Web Services for some ingestion of IoT data. Um, personally, I've, I've used TensorFlow Lite for micro microcontrollers together with uh, Arduino Nano hardware. We use 3D engines like Unity and Unreal. Uh, for some of our VizLab work. So it's really, it's a very diverse ecosystem. And I'd like to close uh, this talk with the, uh, the observation that I'm very happy to be able to say that the overwhelming majority of this is open source with permissive licenses, right? That's it from me. You will hear more from colleagues later today 
who give you the really interesting stuff about the work that they did. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frank, for your presentation. So are there any questions? Yes. Uh, yes, uh, thank you for the very nice overview. Um, I was a bit triggered by this last slide uh, because there is a lot of interesting technologies in here. I can also imagine that uh, many people in the group at some point want to do similar things. So I, I just wonder how do you ensure that people within the same department even uh, don't reinvent the wheel all the time? How do you make sure that whatever they code up with scikit-learn or PostGIS or whatever, uh, is also being used by other people when relevant? That's a very good question. And uh, yeah, I have to admit, it's not easy. Right? There are a lot of people working on different products uh, and projects. Um, so obviously, we, we try to have, for example, uh, regular meetings. We do have regular meetings where colleagues can present their work, and they do. Um, so that's one way of exchanging knowledge, what's going on, who's working on what with which no, uh, software. Um, we also have uh, specialized, more specialized thematic groups like an analytics group um, who even more frequently exchanges uh, experiences specifically for, for machine learning uh, related work. So that's it. We try to do it on, on many different uh, uh, channels continuously, but uh, there is probably still room for improvement, yeah. OK, thank you. Thank you very much again, Frank. Yeah, thanks um, for having me. Maybe just a small comment. Actually, I think eSign Center is a common a code repository. That is not the case for ITC. So maybe it can give some ideas about that. 